Good morning. Welcome to worship. As we continue our series, Peeled, looking at the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, today we're going to look at love and joy. I just wanted to say good morning to everybody who's here in the room with us in the worship center. Good morning to our congregation, our members, our singers, our worshipers over in the gym today. Good morning to our brothers and sisters out in Brockport, and good morning to those who are joining us online, one church in many places, as a family of God. And in families, we make decisions together, right? You have to make decisions on where you're going on vacation, and you have to make budgetary decisions, and all types of decisions. We have to do that as a family. And as a church body, we need to make decisions as well. So we're going to watch a video that helps us understand better how we make decisions as a faith community. Let's take a look. Here at Hope, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we walk by faith and we make decisions together. And as a family believers, as members of Hope Church, we want everyone to take an intentional role and be involved in the decisions that are made. One of the ways we do that is called voters' assemblies. It's a meeting typically one time a year where we gather to celebrate what God has done in the past we look forward to what God has impressed on the leaders for the following year, and then we vote on things like the budget or other needs that the body of Christ has in this corner of the earth. Anyone interested can attend, but you do need to have gone through the five G's and be an active member to vote. Things that we vote on are things like calling a pastor or expanding our facilities, as we've just seen completed at our Greece campus. And then on occasion, we have a need for a special voters' assembly for things that can't wait till the end of the year, like we recently did with the approval of the sale of the residents here at the Brockport campus. Though we only typically meet one time a year as a church in a voters' assembly, our board of directors meets monthly. And those minutes to those meetings can be found on our website. Just go to the homepage, hit About Us, and it's a, you'll find that at the bottom. Jesus calls us to unity. Not that we all look the same, act the same, or think the same, but that we would be united in vision and mission. And this is just one of the ways we do that here at Hope. And in that spirit of unity, knowing that a special voters meeting is going to be coming up for the renovation work that we have planned for this Brockport campus, we wanted to let you know about two informational meetings that are coming up. The first one is here at the Brockport campus on Sunday, July 18th at 1230, right after our 1115 service. The second will be at the Greece campus on Wednesday night, July 21st at 7 p.m. So mark your calendars, because I can't wait to show you what God is planning as we continue in this multi-site journey of being one church in two locations. See you then. Will you bow your heads and pray with me? Father God, as we prepare our hearts for worship this morning, we ask that you open us up to your word and we invite your spirit into this room. Soften our hearts and let us be attentive to what it is that you have in store for us. In Jesus' name, amen. From God's word, in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. It does not rejoice in sin, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. May God, who gives this patience and encouragement, help you live in complete harmony with each other. Then all of you can join together with one voice, giving praise and glory to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's enter into the presence of our holy God and worship him this morning.
Well, good morning. Good to be here with you folks. Uh, for the next uh, few weeks, as Julie said, we're going to be looking at the fruit of the Spirit as they're listed in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and uh, 23. Now, I don't know about you, but um, I, I look at this list in the Bible, and we're going to be looking at it in just a sec, and I have this desire to live a fruitful life, both in my relationship with my God, but also in my relationship with those around me. And maybe you have that same desire. And maybe you've had that desire for a long time. You want to be different. You, you want to live a fruitful life. And so this morning, before we jump into the fruit, so to speak, I really believe uh, we ought to take this matter before the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, uh, we're going to be looking at a, a section of your word, uh, Lord, where we're going to be challenged uh, to be a different people, where we're going to be challenged to live a, a fruitful life. And uh, Lord, uh, we need you. We need your power and your strength. We need you to work in and through us because without you, Lord, uh, we cannot live this life. So, Father, would you bless us? Would you anoint us this morning? Remind us that you're here. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, here's the fruit of the Spirit from Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. It says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self control. And we're going to be looking at each one of these individually. And uh, before we look at them individually, though, just a couple of things uh, for us to consider. And, and the first is this. I really believe that most people, if not all people, would want um, this fruit uh, to be displayed in their lives. I, I have to believe that even people who are far away from God, they would want to live this kind of life. I mean, look at the first three, love, joy, and peace. I, I have to believe that most people, they want to be loving, they want to be joy-filled, they want to have peace in, in their hearts. And then, well, look at the next three, patience, kindness, and, and goodness. I have to believe that um, uh, people want those things in their lives, and there's not a whole lot of people who are going, you know, those things are nice, patience, kindness, and goodness, but, you know, I'm really aiming to be impatient, cruel, and a really bad person. I don't think anybody thinks that way. They want to be patient, kind, and good. And then look at the next two, faithfulness and gentleness. Most people, don't they want to be a faithful friend and be gentle rather than abrasive? I, I really believe people want. And then the last one, self-control. A lot of people, when it comes to, what, dieting and exercising, a lot of people would say, give me some of this self-control. So first thing to consider is this. I really believe that most people would want these um, fruits of the Spirit to be in their hearts and their lives. And then again, the second thing to consider is this. The fruit mentioned uh, in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23 uh, it, it, it exists and it's to be displayed in our lives for the sake of other people. Okay, so start thinking relationships when we, we look at the fruit of the Spirit the next few weeks. I really believe that they're intended for the, the other, for the other individual. And, and so you look at patience. I, I really believe that, that when God is talking about patience, He's not talking about patience when it comes to a craft you know, you're working on, or, or patience when it comes to playing on the golf course, where I believe that patience is actually impossible. But anyway, it's, it's, it's a patience when it, 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 when in regards to individuals, those around you, to be patient with them. The same is true as self-control. I don't think God was thinking about dieting and exercising. I really believe God was thinking about self-control when it came to other people, so that you might have a stronger and a healthier relationship. And then the final thing to consider is this. What role do we have in producing this fruit? What role do we have? 
you see, a lot of people, they would say, no, 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 fruit just happens. It, it just happens in, in our, our lives. So instead of looking at each one of these and trying to develop them in our lives, they would say the key is to sink your life into the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. And then the key word would be reliance, to be reliant upon the Lord God Almighty. And you see this in Galatians chapter 5, especially the second half of that chapter. And, and here's where you see it. Galatians 5 verse 16, it says, walk by the Spirit. Verse 18, be led by the Spirit. Verse 25, live by the Spirit. And again in verse 25, keep in step with the Spirit. And, and, and those phrases describe the Spirit-filled life where one relies upon the power of the Holy Spirit to, to live that godly life. And I just want you to listen to what Jesus says about the Holy Spirit and, and the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. This is from John chapter 15, verse 26. Jesus says, when the Advocate, that's another name for the Holy Spirit, when the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who goes out from the Father, here's what he'll do. He will testify about me. It's one of the primary works of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's work is to say, look at Jesus. You cannot save yourself. Look to Jesus. See his beauty. See the incredible work that he has done in your heart and your life. Look to Jesus. You see, the Holy Spirit is the one uh, who reminds us that in Christ, you are righteous. In Christ, you are chosen before the foundation of the world. In Christ, you are precious, so precious that he poured out his blood for you. In Christ, you are no longer just a servant, but you are a friend of God. In Christ, you are no longer a slave, but you are a son or daughter. In Christ, you are filled with the fullness of God. In Christ, you are blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And that's the work of the Spirit. The Spirit would say, look at Jesus. Look at what he has done. And, and so people would say, look to Christ. Just look to him. And you will bear fruit. And, and isn't that what Jesus said? In John chapter 15, verse 5. In that verse, Jesus says, I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And I love the way a preacher by the name of J.D. Greer, how he states this. He says, for every one look you take at yourself, bemoaning your fruitlessness, take ten looks at Christ, boasting in his faithfulness. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> That was really weird, okay? <laughs> so they would say again, don't worry about developing each of the fruits of the Spirit in your life. Um, I've been doing this for too long, apparently. <laughs> Just blew a gasket, okay? <laughs> so don't worry about developing this fruit in your life. Just be connected to Christ and rely on Him, and you will see that fruit happen. I, I understand that. But then again, I see verse after verse in the Bible where God calls us, challenges us, convicts us, encourages us to grow in, in the fruit of the Spirit. And, and, and so the, this morning, it's not an either or, it's a both and. When we talk about the fruit of the Spirit, it's both relying upon Jesus and looking at Him and being challenged by the Spirit to look at each of the fruits of the Spirit and to grow in them. And so this morning, we want to take a look at the first two. In Galatians chapter 5, we're going to be looking at love and joy. And first of all, there is love. L'amour. Love. The Beatles sang a song, right? All you need is love. That's all you need, love. They also sang another song with some really pretty deep lyrics. I love you, yeah, 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 okay? I just put that on the front of a Hallmark card, right? 
Uh, beautiful. Jay Giles' band, they sang Love Stinks. When we were in college, we sang Lunch Stinks, because quite frankly, the food in our cafeteria was rather abysmal, so we just sang Lunch Stinks. And, and okay, guys, uh, get out a pen and a paper right now. I'm going to really bless you this morning. I'm going to share with you some romantic words of love. You can write them down and then buy a card uh, for, for your uh, wife or your girlfriend and and you can write these words in the card, but it, w- it won't work if she's here right now because she'll know where you got them from. But uh, anyway, here are some, just some beautiful words concerning love. You ready? Herman Hesse, he said, if I know what love is, it is because of you. Oh, guys, write it down. Hurry. Okay, it's going to disappear quickly. Next one. This is author unknown. I need you like a heart needs a beat. Oh, short one, guys. <laughs> Okay, maybe you can even remember that one. You can look in her eyes and say, I I need you like a heart needs a beat. Now, next one, also author unknown. Great one. Thinking of you keeps me awake. Dreaming of you keeps me asleep. Being with you keeps me alive. Guys, oh, there's a winner. Okay, write it down. Okay. And then finally, Angelita Lim, she said, I saw that you were perfect and so I loved you. Then I saw that you were not perfect, and I loved you even more. I think she was lying. Okay. (laughs) Anyway, uh, great words. But seriously, um, we're we're looking at love in Galatians chapter 5. And what is this love? Because we've got songs and we've got these wonderful words written, but do we really know what it is? What God is calling us to. And the Greek word for love used in Galatians chapter 5 is the word agape. Maybe you've heard that before. Uh, Years ago, I I learned that uh, agape is intelligent comprehension. Okay, it has something to do with the mind. Intelligent comprehension united with a a blessed and an amazing response. And, And so let me explain that, okay, this morning. And let me begin by sharing with you that there's another Greek word for love, and the other Greek word for love is phileo. Phileo is a kinship love. It's loving those who are in the family. Phileo is loving a person with the understanding, chances are, they're going to love you back. That's phileo. Agape is far different. It's intelligent comprehension. You know something about the individual. You know, for example, that they hate you. They don't like you at all. You know that. You you, you know that this person, um, they are uh, despising you. You know that. It's intelligent comprehension. You know that about the individual. And yet there is this blessed and amazing response that, quite frankly, this world doesn't understand. Because instead of reciprocating and hating them back, despising them back, you actually love them. That's agape. And even when they then don't love you back, you still love them. That's agape. And this kind of love Jesus speaks about in his great Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, verse uh, 44. Jesus speaks about this love. He says, but I tell you, love your enemies. And pray for those who persecute you. And the word Jesus uses is not phileo. He uses the word agape. Again, you comprehend. They don't like you. They're they're persecuting you. They, They hate you. But you love them. You agape them to the point that you are even willing to pray for them. Well, I want you to understand that when it comes to God, this agape it's far deeper. God knows something about us. God knows about our depravity. You see, God has a very high standard. God's standard for us and and for our lives, every thought, word, and action, God's standard is perfection. Okay, God knows that. He knows the standard, and he knows that we have fallen short. In fact, the apostle Paul, he quotes the book of Psalms. In, In Romans chapter 3, verse 10, And he says, there is no one righteous, not even one. God knows that. Only one who lived a perfectly righteous life, and that is his son, Jesus Christ. But God knows that we have fallen short. 
And God, he knows that sometimes, sometimes we cloak our depravity in a robe of religiosity. That we just go through religious motions, hoping that God, he'll just see those religious motions and he won't see the heart. But the Bible says in Isaiah 29, verse 13, it says, these people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. God knows that. Intelligent comprehension. God knows that we are sinners and we cannot save ourselves. God knows that we need a Savior. Now, God could embrace this world, you and me, with phileo. But phileo means we're on the same level. And, and, and God could have loved us with phileo, but the expectation would be that we would love him back. Instead, God, he loved us with agape. A, a no-strings-attached kind of love. And that agape is seen in God sending his one and only son when we didn't deserve it, even when we didn't want it to die upon a cross for the forgiveness of our sins, for our cleansing. And that's the blessed and amazing response. That's agape, intelligent comprehension. God knows that we have fallen short, and yet there is this blessed and amazing response. He gives us his undeserved love in his son Jesus. And so, I just want you to know that when God talks about the fruit of the Spirit, in Galatians chapter 5, and he begins with love, that's the kind of love that he's calling us to. In fact, in, in 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, here, here's the challenge, here's the call. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. And once again, the word for love in that entire verse, again, it's the word agape. He is saying, that's how I love you. I want you to love those around you in the same way. Intelligent comprehension. But there is this blessed and amazing response. And I believe from God's vantage point, he wanted that to mark his people. He wanted them to be different. He wanted them to stand out in this world. The kind of love that God has given to us, agape, he wants it to be reflected through us to a broken and a hurting world. And, and this morning, let's be clear. This love is not love when it seeks something in return. Spouses can fall into that trap, loving one another in that way. Parents can fall into that same trap. And there are times when we use love, don't we, to engender some kind of response in the other person. And so we think to ourselves, okay, I will love you in word and action, but I'm hoping to gain something in my giving you my love. Folks, that's not agape. That's not even phileo. That's manipulation. Agape love does not seek any kind of gain. In fact, it's willing to lose everything for the sake of the other. And God calls us to that kind of love. And when we love one another in that way, we see that it, it, it has a huge impact uh, upon our relationships. Folks, once again, here, here's what I see in, in counseling with, with husbands and wives and counseling with other individuals as well. So often, I, I, I hear this negotiation. I hear this tension going on in the relationship. And, and, and so he says, um, I will love you only if you love me. And she will say, well, I'll love you if you only love me. And, and there are these defense mechanisms, these walls going up. I, I don't want to go out on a limb and love you because maybe you're not going to love me back. Or, or individuals say, I'll love you. But if you don't love me back, I'm going to stop loving you. And, and, and back and forth they go. And there seems to be this impasse where, where nobody loves anybody. And, and the focus ultimately is me. I don't want to lose. 
I, I don't want to be left out on the limb. Agape is far different. When you love one another with an agape love, and you're willing even to go out on the limb, and even when they don't love you back, you keep on loving them. It's a huge impact upon the relationship. Because what I've seen is this so often, that agape love takes those walls, those defense mechanisms down. You love and you keep on loving and you see the impact that it has upon that relationship. And understand this morning that this first fruit mentioned in the spirit-filled life is love and really love becomes the basis for all of the fruit. In, in fact, in the Apostle Paul's uh, great letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, you know that great love chapter in the Bible used in many weddings? Uh, Paul ends by saying this in verse 13. He says, and now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. It's true. And it's so true when we begin looking at the second uh, fruit of the Spirit. Where there is this agape love, there is a great possibility that there is joy as well. And, and we're going to be looking at joy. It's something this world is chasing after and looking in all the wrong places. And sometimes, uh, sometimes people call it this good feeling inside. Sometimes they call it happiness. But they're looking, they're looking in all the wrong places. C.S. Lewis, uh, he once said, Our Lord finds our desires not too strong but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in the slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. And again, people look for joy. They go down all of these avenues, all the ones possible, imaginable, and, and some feel that they have found it, but then it slips away. What, what is this joy that, that um, the Apostle Paul writes about in Galatians chapter 5? It actually may be easier for me this morning to share with you where joy is not found. So, first of all, it's not found in unbelief, even though a lot of people who turn away from God feel that they are far happier, that they have, um, you know, uh, release themselves from the shackles of religion. Well, yeah. But what about the, the loving, merciful God? A lot of people say, yeah, I'm doing far better without Him. And yet they come to a point where they begin to understand that there is still this void that cannot be filled. And they're still chasing after this elusive thing called happiness or joy. Uh, Voltaire, uh, who... Um, didn't believe in Jesus Christ, he said, I wish I had never been born. There's joy, right? It's not found in pleasure. Lord Byron, he lived a life of pleasure. And yet he wrote, I wish uh, the worm, the canker, and the grief are mine alone. It's not found in money. Jay Gould had lots of it. And yet as he was dying, he said, I suppose I'm the most miserable man on earth not found in military glory. Alexander the Great conquered the known world, and then he went into his tent, and he started crying, and he said, there are no more worlds to conquer. It's not found in any of those things. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 6, the apostle Paul wrote, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Joy is found in the truth. And in John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. True and lasting joy is only found in Jesus Christ. In John chapter 15, verse 11, Jesus says, I have told you this. He talked about being divine and we're the branches. He said, I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Joy is found in the Savior who laid down his life so that we would be set free to live forever. And my question is, do you have that joy? In my mind, a true joy is this inner confidence that bubbles up because of the grace of God in our possession. That's joy. 
that you know that you've been loved in a remarkable way. It's this inner confidence, and it just bubbles up. You don't have to have a smile on your face, but there is still joy. My dad had it. He had it. Tomorrow marks the first anniversary of my dad's death. And maybe I've shared this with you before, but can I just tell you about the last time I heard from my dad? We had a family meeting. I was here in my office looking at a computer screen. My mom, sister, dad were in Canada meeting with a team of doctors. So here's what's going on. I'm looking at the screen. I'm looking at my dad. My dad is looking at the doctor. And the doctor said to him, Steve, we can try dialysis, but it probably won't work. I was looking at my dad, thinking that he's suddenly going to put his head down and start bursting into tears. My dad, uh, he would do this. You know, he just listened. He goes, that's okay. He said, I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus Christ. I know where I'm going when I die. There's a guy in the Old Testament named Ezra. Ezra said, the joy of the Lord is my strength. That's what I saw in my dad at that very moment. He had the joy of the Lord. It was his strength in in this really difficult time. I just want you to know that the joy of the Lord makes a huge difference in relationships. It made a huge difference with me and my dad. To hear that from him, to see the confidence bubble up and see it on his face and hear it in his word. Folks, you can give people all the money in the world and, and, and it won't be enough. You, you, you can seek to give those around you in your relationships. You can seek to give them pleasure, and it won't be enough. But it's the joy of the Lord. It's the joy of the Lord when, when that is expressed, when that is given, when it bubbles up this inner confidence. It makes all the difference in the world. I know. I saw it. In Jesus' name, let's pray. Uh, Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you now. And uh, Lord, we looked at these first two fruits of the Spirit this morning. And and, uh, Lord, um, would you just uh, take those words that are in Scripture and now would you just work them into our hearts and our lives. We just pray, Lord, that we would be different. We pray, Lord, that... uh, we would turn and look to your son Jesus, understanding that with him we will produce much fruit. But then, oh Holy Spirit, would you challenge us? Would you convict us where we need to be convicted when it comes to love and joy? And and would you show us, oh Holy Spirit, what is true and what is lasting? Lord, move in us, move in this place that we will be uh, people who love in a magnificent way that it will be noticed by the people in this world, my, how they love one another. Uh, Lord, we we pray that we would be a joy-filled people, that we would seek, Lord, you out and find that the joy is found in the truth of your Son, Jesus, and in salvation that comes from him. There, ultimately, is our joy, that everything has been taken care of for now and even into eternity. Lord, give us that joy. And and again, just move in this place, so Holy Spirit, at this time, would would your love, Lord, just come down? Would it come down upon us? And, and, And Lord, would we just be filled with this agape love at this very moment? That that we would know that we didn't deserve it, we didn't earn it, yet you gave us everything. You gave us your all. You've given us the kingdom. Lord, may your love come down. We pray all this. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Let's rise to worship him this morning. (laughs) 
I will sing forever of your love come down with my hands to heaven shout your praises loud I was lost in darkness when you pulled me out I will sing forever of your love come down One, two.
Amen. Hallelujah. For those uh, who are watching us online, we just uh, hope and pray that you have a glorious, glorious day.